Hey there, folks, and welcome to another episode of Crit Hit Interviews. I'm Arlian, and we're here today with Dave Szymanski, whose works compromise a fairly wide variety of themes with shooters like Chop Goblins and Dusk, as well as narrative titles like The Moon Silver, The Music Machine, and more experimental titles besides, like Iron Lung. Hello! I think that's a pretty good, like, small summary of your not-quite-complete body of works. Yeah! Yeah, that about covers it. There, there was also, like, the puzzle demake of Dusk. Um, yeah, Dusk 82, which is actually one of my favorite games that I've made, although it's one of the less popular ones, understandably. I, like, considered going into it before, but I was like, I've already covered, like, most of your library, and I'm taking forever yeah. just doing this. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's one that I just sort of made because I wanted to. Uh, you know, I knew it wasn't going to... Uh, it wasn't going to sell that well or anything, but it was just something I kind of wanted to do. I mean, so here's my question. Like, there is a pretty active DMake community that exists in Reddits and other places. Like, how well received was it by the DMake community and also by, like, fans of the original Dusk? Oh, I have no idea. I'm not... I'm... I'm not really involved in my, many game dev communities, um, so I've I have no idea how other how like a, the D Make community saw it. As far as fans of Dusk, I mean, it's got a really good review score. Everyone who who decided to give it a try seems to have enjoyed it for what it is. So, you know, very happy with that. I mean, yeah, that works. Um, I, I was like. Yeah, it's on. It's on that list of like, do I wanna? Do I want it? Because it looked a little bit um, roguish, but then I realized like it was actually apparently like more puzzly. Like I believe the actual yeah. stages are handcrafted as opposed. To yes, it. it's yeah. It's not a roguelike at all. Um, it's it was primarily inspired by um, Chip's Challenge, and also which is a super old. If you no chips challenge you're probably like old like i am but um that and this really obscure q basic game called dark woods not dark wood not the the horror game on steam but uh dark woods uh which i actually just straight lifted some mechanics from because i've always thought they were really cool fair enough uh, <laughs> i suppose i'll have to give it a try later finish off my completing all of your games and putting them on my review YouTube. <laughs> well, it'll always be there, so there's no rush. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so despite the fact that I've sort of gotten a bit into the technical questions a little bit earlier, um, normally I don't just, you know, talk to people about their body of work. So I tend to try and start these interviews off with like a little bit of a focus on the person behind, but I got a little off track there. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, but hey, I mean, it gives something for the gaming focused aficionados in the audience, something to sink their teeth into, though there was also going to be a list of questions briefly splashed on the screen in case there's something in specific you folks want to know about that I might have covered. Um, but yeah, beyond that, care to tell us a bit about yourself and, and also things beyond like your love of posting very brave traumatizing topics on Twitter because that's how I originally bumped into you and then I just realized you were also in the DreadX Discord. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, no, I saw you on Twitter first and then I was like, oh wait, you're actually in here. Wow, this makes contacting you a lot easier technically. It did not. Twitter was still the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really funny that I'm now getting to the point where like people find me on Twitter first. Um... <laughs> Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I'm not a very interesting person, uh, actually. I... You're in good company, um, then. <laughs> yeah, outside, of, outside of my games, there's really not all that uh, interesting about me. I live in uh, semi-rural Northwest PA. I uh, have a wife and two little girls, um, and uh, four cats, one of which... Uh, I should say three cats, one possibly a cat uh and one dog what what do you mean and, by possibly a cat like is it a raccoon well, secretly or um here, here let me actually i'll drop you uh a photograph real quick um fantastic i'll be sure to ask my editor to splash this on the screen 
This is Zamboni. You um, named your cat Zamboni? Yes. That is fantastic. Here, let's... I'll just paste the image in. Um, uh, he go. has a Twitter? There's Zamboni. He does have a Twitter. Um, he looks like a goblin, and I love him. He does. Yeah, he's he's our little problem... Not really problem cat. He's our, uh, our luxury cat. He has to go to the vet uh, pretty much on a... a semi-monthly basis um he has he his brain is very obviously damaged but it's in like an amazing way because it just makes he's like completely fearless and really really friendly like he has no fear about anything like he wouldn't survive in the wild at all yeah um, but he's just like he is the friendliest cat um and we love him a lot but yeah as you can see it's he's got some stuff going on um his little goblin so, smile is great though yeah yeah it's, um he's the best and yeah we made a twitter for him because other people also love him uh our little goblin we uh and the, <laughs> the joke everyone always makes is that he looks like the orc from lord of the rings i the, was the, one, the white orc thinking more like a gremlin but yeah. I mean, he does look like the one orc now that you picture, now that you pointed it out. But I'm like, yeah, that's that's the joke everyone always makes. Nah, um, I like I first saw like he's a goblin or like a gremlin. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Oh. Yeah, he's great. So, plenty of pets. Um, and really not a whole else lot going on other than making games. I um, I I write a little bit. I do have a book on Amazon that probably nobody should buy because it's really dumb. Um, uh, are we called... talking like Chuck Tingle dumb? For anyone, I don't who's... know who that is. But, um, um, you should search up Chuck Tingle. <laughs> okay. So should anyone oh. watching this video because it has some very fascinating titles. He has an entire series of books, in fact, that are part of the Tingleverse. I've never read a single one, but the- Oh, I'm seeing these now! Uh-huh, uh-huh, the, the <laughs> titles are something. Okay, these are amazing. The physical manifestation of Twitter's rapid descent into chaos thanks to a nip management from a man-baby edgelord pounds me in the butt. That is an actual <laughs> title. <laughs> yep, I'm seeing that right here. Okay, so not quite to that extent, but a little bit along the same line. It's like, uh, it's called Monkey Aladdin, and it's just complete surrealism. I started it when I was 15, um, and I've just, like, I, I gradually wrote and rewrote it for a few years and then published it. And then did a physical publishing um, last year, just for the heck of it, just because I wanted to. Mostly so I could get uh, copies for myself. And you should also include um, it as like part of a, a bundle with one of the physical copies of your game one day. That would be amazing, <laughs> yeah. Right? So I, I Sign copies do, in, in 10 yeah. years. <laughs> so I do some writing, and that's actually something I'd like to do a bit more of in the future. Um, I'm also a composer, and actually that's what I have my degree in. Um, huh. So I, I have no education in anything game, game dev related. I'm a um, classical violinist. Uh, so um, That's so cool, though. Yeah, it... it uh, I mean, I heard it's a shit ton of work, but like... It is, yeah. Violin yeah. and cellos are, like, I guess the sexiest instruments to me. I don't know what to say. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, no. That's they're, a bonus. They're they're great. Um, yeah, they're really not. The human body wasn't really meant to play violin, and so like a huge amount of like advanced, uh, like learning, uh, practicing the violin and stuff is really just you're contorting your body into a really unnatural, stressful position, and then you have to tell all your muscles to relax, <laughs> and that's like a, what the the big challenge. Um, but so, yeah, I'm, uh, I've always really loved composing, and I used to think that's what I was gonna do as a career, um, and I guess I kind of do. I write most of the music for my games, with the exception of Dusk, um, and I do, you know, I write some music on the side, I have a little band camp, just for fun, and, you know, maybe someday that'll take off in some little way also, you never know. 
Um, but any... yeah, most... Violin? I was gonna say, is there any, like, violin tracks that you've done in any of the games? Yes. Um, the... all of... So the... the recording quality is awful, because I literally recorded it on a headset mic, but the... the soundtrack for the music machine, all of the string stuff is me playing. Ah, oh, that's awesome. And then in, um... Oh, wait, that means Dusk, you also composed I... the little the bonus room in the music machine, didn't you? Yep. All the <laughs> all the music, ever all of the music in all of my games except for Dusk and Dusk eighty two is stuff I wrote. Um, <laughs> so, this is, yeah, lots of different crazy stuff. Um, and the soundtrack for um, Sawdust, the level Sawdust and Dusk, all of the violin stuff is me on that. That's um, cool. Yeah, so there's a little bit in there. Um, and But yeah, mostly what I do is I make games um, and play games. So I just have like a small little question that I'm going to actually lead into the proper one. But like, what is your favorite genre of gaming or, or game? Uh, FPS. Okay. I, I mean, uh, I was a little bit like, it's probably this, given like a lot yeah. of the recent things in your Twitter posts, but... Yeah, so... it's always been FPS, and it's very weird that I have made so many, I guess what a lot of people would call walking simulator games. I was about um, to <laughs> yeah. ask that, was the focus then on narrative-focused walking sims, or like, I guess, um, narrative exploration games, because you enjoyed writing and wanted an example to like flex your prose, or was there something else behind it, like you trying to make something you weren't as familiar with? Um, I guess a lot of different things. Um, so my my formative games, uh, as a, well, starting as a kid and then getting into being like a younger teenager, were first Mist, and then Doom, and Half Life. Those were like the the three games that defined me growing up. Um, Same, but swap um, Doom with Worms. Okay. Um, so the I guess yeah, I've always uh, FPS is like my main genre. That that's most of what I play. But I get a lot of enjoyment out of also exploring places. Mm -hmm. Um, and also solving puzzles. I've always really liked um point and click adventures. I don't play as many of them uh, as. I think, uh, like, I always think of, like, oh, yeah, point-and-click adventure, but I mostly don't end up playing a lot, but like I said, Myst was, like, a real formative game for me, so I've always had this love of, like, exploring a place and solving stuff. I finished um, Myst. I still need to finish Riven. Riven is incredible. Like, it's Myst is the one that... fucking I'm, hard, is what it is. Yeah, it's, it is. Um, Myst is the one that I'm, like, uh, that, you know, it's that was my childhood game. That's always going to be the one that I have the most fondness for but Riven is like better in every conceivable way it's inc it is an incredibly good game it, it's um, super I think if you don't run into it with a guide and you're just doing it yourself like it's such a good but like immersive yeah. challenge because you have to like live that world and figure out like everything yeah. It's a type of game that in a, in a way doesn't exist as much anymore, where it's like, this was expected to kind of be your life for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and you were not expected to be able to blow it through it in a weekend. It's like you were supposed to get stuck on these puzzles and have to really think them over for a while and stuff. Jot down um, notes, come back to it later yeah. while you explored the rest of the world and like sort of yeah. pieced everything together. Like, it was... Yeah. No. Yeah. So, so, like, I think the... Outside of genres, the, like it, it makes maybe with me it makes more sense to talk about what are the things I like doing in games. And the things I like doing in games are I like exploring and I like shooting stuff. Mm. Um, so if you think of it in that in that way, it's like the stuff that I've made makes a lot more sense because all the narrative driven stuff. For one thing, yeah, I I also like writing and I like I like writing more story driven stuff um, sometimes. But also, like those, are, they're very exploration focused. Even th though they're not necessarily non-linear, it's like there's a big focus on putting you in this environment and having you just kind of look around and start piecing things together. 
honestly that that, that that makes me ask more questions about um not finger bones which was horror focused and you definitely seem to be an avid fan of horror but um yes the sort of um it's another point and click puzzle but you actually had like some non-linear puzzle solving because a few of the puzzles had multiple ways to figure it out like you could cut the the line of a balloon or pop it or didn't you need to deal with the balloon you could grab something from like beyond the fence to open a lock i'm trying to remember the name of it oh in uh a wolf in autumn yes yeah yeah that was and you know what no one ever really talks about that um but that was something I thought was really cool in that, is that every... Is it every puzzle? Most of the puzzles, at least, have... A lot of the puzzles have different solutions. Yeah, and almost all the solutions are, like, stuff that... Like, problem-solving that makes sense. Where it's like, oh, I have a saw. Can I use this saw to cut this rope instead of a knife? Or, you know, things like that. Yeah. I, I, I actually did review that game and comment on it. I just... I, I can't recall what it came down to i remember i was like it is really dark sometimes and like yeah, losing something in the dark yeah yeah that that game's a mess there's a lot of mistakes i made with that um and it's probably my least popular game uh, too so it definitely seemed like you were flexing like for prose wise like that one definitely yeah. seemed prose heavy yeah i was i now looking back i'm like wow like what was I thinking? Where I thought that I could get I could get away with doing an indie horror game where it starts off with like Faulkner stream of consciousness, like, and I got so many people commenting, being like, "Wow, these run-on sentences are awful." <laughs> it's like now I would know, no, don't do that. No one's gonna get it. But at the time, I was just like, "Oh man, you know," because I I love Faulkner. I want to like kind of use this Faulkner stream of consciousness uh, prose at the beginning to get sort of the psychology of the mother. And it's I, w I was I was way overthinking it, and it was just a bad idea. But you know, I, I have my own notes jotted down, and if you want to see them later, um, <laughs> because I would ha I'd, like my mind is deceived sometime, and I remember mm -hmm. going through it and finding it interesting, but like as far as your narrative games. Moon Silver and the Music Machine, or where it's at, and the fact that they have like that interconnected shared universe thing was also neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just tried to do way too much with A Wolf and Autumn. I was getting burned out at that point too. So, um, yeah, I mean that's Dusk is came right after that. Where I was hmm. just I was kind of burnt out on making those sort of games, and also just on the horror scene in general. I had a lot of. Uh, bitterness at that point about how things were going and so is that like yeah, so dusk is sort of like a, a a pulpy grindhouse horror as opposed to like i don't know there's yeah. like different horrors out there and like a lot of them just don't do anything for me like i can mm -hmm. count so like i'm currently playing prey i can count on one hand the amount of times i've been spooked in that game but there's one notable one that did it and it's when you're uh and it was a jump scare but it was a pretty decent one it's when you're like um calibrating the looking glass <laughs> that's such a cheeky moment yeah i shot it's the glass so and i imagine evil. everyone fucking shot the glass but it's such yeah. a good thing because oh it's it's such a cheeky moment it's great that game's great I, um, yeah, I was not expecting to be anywhere near as good as it was, because I was, like, really grumpy at them because of, like, oh, hey, big company, like, messed over a small indie company and basically, like, stopped them from using the word prey in their title, and I'm like, that's a dick move. I'm never going to play this. And then it went for, like, 90% off, and I'm like, yeah, I, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess well, it's an I'll... arcane game. Arcane never, arcane has yet to make a bad game. We'll see how Redfall goes, goes but... Yeah, they're like the... <sighs> I like their way to like world design and that has continued, which by the way, um, we, we've got on tangents already. Yeah, this happens. Any games you're diving into currently? Yes, I've been on a massive Half-Life kick recently, as you alluded to with my, <laughs> my Twitter. I I don't know why, but um, I'm just... Well, okay, some, I, guess, I guess I'll give a short background. Um, I decided this year I'm not doing releasing any solo games. I'm just going to focus on... There's a couple of things happening this year, some of which have not been announced yet, but which are exciting. Um, I might and ask I'm just for hints focus, later. 
Oh, I can't. It's, not even a genre. <laughs> not even a genre hint. No, because um, well, it's I can give a genre hint that it's horror, but okay. I can't tell you anything else. Um, um so you couldn't you will, say uh, you if it's prose focused or not. No, you will understand when it's announced. Okay. Um, but because I've got this other stuff, I'm like, I'm not gonna, because I tend to, I, I tend to be a bit of a workaholic and I tend to push myself. Mm -hmm. And so I've been feeling like I'm getting burnt out again. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that this year. I'm just going to kind of take it easy. Um, and I do have adult ADHD or whatever they call it. Did they Same. get rid of the age? Is it now just ADHD? I, I think it's I just, remember, a, but... I, I think it's just ADD slash ADHD. Um, I have yeah. it as well. Um, yeah. So I've, I, I get pretty strong hyper focus. Um, do you also get the leg twitch? Have, no, I don't have that. I'm very fidgety, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm very fidgety, but I have the leg twitch. Oh, okay. Like, like the oh wait, like uh, bouncing your leg. Yeah, constantly. You, yeah. Constantly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've done that before. My family uh, also rocks like forward and back. Mm -hmm. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, because I don't have, uh, like solo projects to hyper focus on, now my brain has decided that it's going to hyper focus on Half Life. Um, so I've been playing a whole bunch of... Ha I've been playing Half-Life 1, I've been playing Half-Life 1 mods, I've been playing Half-Life 2, I've been playing Black Mesa, and just basically um, all Half-Life all the time. How I don't are know you why. enjoying Black um, Mesa? Um, I've... So this is, I think, will be the third time I've tried playing Black Mesa. Um, the first time was way back in the, the initial partial release in like 2012 yeah i didn't bother whatever. until it had until it, i i owned it for ages because i was interested yeah. but i never wanted to play it till it was finished so i had like a good snapshot of what they were trying to achieve in total rather than yeah yeah um so and then i tried it again whenever that that full release happened i forget when that was like a few years back mm -hmm. um and it just wasn't like absolutely no criticism of the the work the team did it's like an incredible project but it just wasn't really doing it for me i was playing through it and i eventually got to i think i i got right to the up to the end of on a rail and i was like i'd really rather just replay half-life one like there's i didn't like some of the changes there's there's a, some little changes in how they approach designing the game that um was like i felt took away from it and so i just kind of was like done then um but now more recently i decided to go back in and very specific first of all i just kind of i just got done playing half-life one so i'm not gonna um need to go back and replay half-life one and second of all i'm really really specifically trying to look at it as not comparing it to the original game and just looking at it as its own thing and i've been having a much more fun time that way nice. uh there's still some things that I don't prefer in Black Mesa. I think the biggest one is how um, Half-Life 1's actually a really sort of emergent game at times, and Black Mesa takes all of that out. Um, but other, th I mean, that other nit nitpicks aside, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Just wait till you get to Zen. Um, Zen was like the part where I went like, this is decent to like... I would rather have Black Mesa Zen and base Half Life Zen. <laughs> That's it. But like, it's it's like massive compared to the original game Zen, but it feels yeah, I've heard better. That. It mm -hmm. just feels better on the whole. You're not like constantly dying like stupid falling damage deaths. Yeah. Um, That's the problem with original Zen. I love the aesthetic and atmosphere and everything. I love it. But, oh, it still has that. It still uh, has a great atmosphere. Yeah, but then the whole like the platforming just kind of wasn't it wasn't the best. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so I've been playing lots lots of Half Life, um, and also the Dead Space remake just came out, and I've sort of been dipping my toes into that. And good lord, that is good. I'm intending. That is so much better than I expected it to be. It's like it's. They, they knew exactly what they were doing because it's a very faithful remake except when it makes changes or additions that are actually for the better like i've been excited really good to look at it and i've heard that it's sort of also paved the way for a dead space 2 remake which um 
honestly, I loved both those games. I felt they really did, like, sort of, hey, do you want to play, like, Event Horizon as, like, a, a fucking gory video game? Let's go. And I was like, yeah, okay. That, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to do a complete playthrough right now, because I actually just got done, like, last month playing the original Dead Space. Um, mm -hmm. But I was I was going to wait until I streamed it, uh, or I was, I was like, commenting on a stream along with um, Dylan Rogers, who's the, the main Gloomwood dev. Mm. Um, and it was like, holy crap, this looks super good, and, like... I, I kind of wanted to then try a little bit of it for myself. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it is the reports of how good it are have not been exaggerated. It's really a, a so far a shining example of how you do a faithful remake. So I'm gonna get us slightly back on topic again because we just both sure. nerded out here. And <laughs> yeah, like I said, this will this will happen every single time I do an interview. It always goes longer than I, I honestly I. Don't mind. Um, I, I'm I'm okay. also sparing people in the audience from me nerding out because I'm a gigantic <laughs> nerd and I'm enjoying the ability to nerd out with someone. But, gotcha. Yeah. Um. So we didn't actually talk about this, though we've sort of talked around it. But what actually was the point or the the thing that got you into game development itself? Because you sort of said you um, don't have the skill set for it. You trained to be like a composer and other elements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I actually started into game dev when I was like 12 or 13, I think. Um, so it was a long time ago. Um, and it was it was missed that did it, I I remember just I, I think I was even laying in bed, but just suddenly I realized okay I knew. They had made Myst using this old um, presentation software called HyperCard. And we were in grade school computer class, or middle school computer class, I guess, at that point. This had uh, this was before, I think this was more like when I was 11. Mm -hmm. um, but we were learning a upgraded version of that called Hyper Studio. And one day it just clicked to me. I'm like, wait, I could make my own thing like Myst. And so I did that, and then that sort of got my brain onto the idea of I could make games and so I started learning Microsoft QBasic out of my uh, one of my dad's old textbooks and for a few years I just made little ASCII games with that um, I'm terrible and then, at QBasic I learned yeah, it too, it was, I'm bad yeah it's not a very powerful language, uh, I really wanted to make an FPS, uh, in fact a few years later, around when I was like 14 or 15 I think is when I started coming up with the idea for Dusk um, in a very you know rough form hmm. um, and you know and then it just took years until I actually was in a position to make it which yeah so you, you've already mentioned like a sort of skill that you had to learn but like what skills in total did you need to learn in order to like ultimately be able to make your first publicized game and like which parts of it did you struggle with the most oh gosh I don't, so when you say first publicized game do you mean first published or do you mean like finger bones like first i one would that I count i would count the first one you published though if there's like a difference in the question between like from the first one you published to finger bones i mean that's also interesting yeah there's because i um i published like f five or six games before or more maybe um those two i think i think around like five oh maybe more like seven <laughs> um, but yeah, I've um, I've been making games for a while, <laughs> uh, but none of those took off at all. Um, I worked in, like I said, I did some little ASCII games in QBasic for a while, and then I sort of drifted away from programming. And then in college, I discovered um, Game Maker, and that reignited this idea of making games. And I made a few things in Game Maker, and then by that point, I was back home and graduated from college, um, and I. I forget why it was like, oh, Unity, I'll try this out. And that's the game I made to kind of learn Unity was Fingerbones. Um, 
So I guess my answer being that I can't really remember exactly back when, like, my first actual published game was when I was like 15 or something, and that was like a decade and a half ago, or no longer. Jeez, how old am I now? It's longer. That's almost two decades ago at this point. Um, so uh, you're only yeah. you're only as old as you feel, right? You can just forget yeah. one of those decades. It's fine. Well, unfortunately, when um, once you hit your 30s, you start feeling old also, so... Nah, um, I refuse to believe this, because I'm probably <laughs> as old as you are. Uh, how old are you? 35. Oh, jeez, okay, no, I'm actually younger than you are, I'm 33. Yep, no, I am um, only as old as I feel. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. You're, you're younger <laughs> than me in spirit. Um, but for... I think Fingerbones is probably the more interesting and relevant discussion because that was my first Unity game and that was also the first game that I put out there that had any sort of, you know, groundswell behind it. And really that's where I started doing game dev as a career rather than just as a hobby. Even though Fingerbones wasn't paid for, it was really successful for what it was and that made me decide to do the moon sliver by, by the way it's the moon sliver not the moon silver which is a very very common mistake for people to make because i was stupid naming it the moon sliver <laughs> because of course everyone's gonna see that and say oh it's the moon silver um yep I'm but a, that's I, I always see it that way i don't know yeah it, it was a stupid title i shouldn't have done it but no it's fine uh, it's, it's, it's fine it, you can blame us for being dumb and having terrible <laughs> comprehension <laughs> i could do that i guess that's you true. did let um, me sit there though and call it the the moon silver earlier without correcting yeah. me until now yeah i wasn't sure when to bring it up <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh so, so yeah, with Fingerbones, what I, I I already had a bit of a programming background, you know, because I'd done QBasic and I'd done, I'd done Game Maker, which is their own language, GML or something, it's their own language. Um, so I knew how to program to, to a certain extent, at least enough to make games with. And so I had that down, but I hadn't ever done anything in like a true 3D environment. And I, so I had no idea what the workflow is for like making models or texturing those models or anything like that so i was learning all this and like watching video youtube tutorials and looking up documentation and stuff as i'm making the game um and actually so the original idea way back when i was just conceptualizing it i wanted to have an art style that was actually kind of similar to what the music machine ended up having um with that sort of monochromatic heavy shadows look um but I had no idea how to do that. And eventually after experimenting around and like failing at a bunch of different things and stuff, I, eventually it was like, I don't actually know how to texture these environments I'm making. Cause that entire game, I made that in Blender. And I was like, I have no idea how to texture this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to make this like no pixel noise texture and everything is gonna have that texture <laughs> and that'll work. Um, so that, that's just an example of like that's how the game was made where it was like if it was something i couldn't quite figure out how to do i just worked within that design i just yeah just worked my way around it um and uh, very until silent kill there <laughs> yeah <laughs> until i had a finished game and put it out and honestly I, like i released it and was like yeah okay so it'll be the same as other games or no one's gonna play it and whatever and went to bed and then i woke up the next morning and i actually had a email from game jolt that it was it was probably a form letter of some sort but it was basically just like thank you for uploading finger bones we're we featured it um as our, our featured game this month <laughs> it's like oh cool okay that game is such a fucking like it is a trip it is bleak yeah that may be the bleakest game i've made i don't know i guess iron iron lung is pretty bleak but i think iron Very lungs is more like Bleed. Yeah, I, I look at Iron Lung as a little more sort of operatic in a way. I was going like, to say it's like an existential bleakness, whereas there's like a very personal, like defiling the like the concept of what is comfortable and familial. Yeah, yeah, f yeah. I don't think I'm. I well, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say that, but it. That may not be something I ever... I may not ever make a game that dark again, but we'll see. Yeah, um, I, sorry that I went into, like, mild prose 
the mild prose mode there. <laughs> no, so, um, I was, I mean, at that point, I was just, like, in an unhappy place as far as, you know, I was poor. I was just married. I'd just gotten married. So we were, like, super poor and both working jobs that we hated. And just, like, I, I had abandoned my idea of, um becoming a music professor because it turned out I hated college so I didn't want to be in college anymore and so it was like what am I even doing with my life so you know it wasn't necessarily a happy life situation I was mm. in at the time and you just um, channeled that misery into the game in a sense yeah yeah I think making those earlier games it was definitely a sense of like channeling unhappiness into them that adds a lot of context <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that had, like so much context to like I mean, the pros like, focus and everything. Yeah, yeah, the, like stuff I had to get out or whatever. Not that again, Iron Lung is pretty bleak, also, but that's sort of a. I feel like I have with um everything leading up to dusk, I was always sort of trying to be as not not necessarily as dark as possible, but it was always supposed to be unhappy and nasty like it was not it was supposed to be something that really like got into your brain and and shook you um whereas when you fast forward ahead to iron lung i was approaching iron lung with the idea of like i just want to make a really cool tangible claustrophobic atmosphere um and everything everything in that game is more focused on like creating this certain feel um rather than just trying to so hurt the, more the player, of a, if that yeah, makes sense. More of a cinematic focus on building an atmosphere, the aesthetic and everything, versus trying to put something in someone's gut that's going to churn there long after they put the game down. Yeah, kind of so. Um, I mean, it's, certain, it's a horror game. It's meant to make you feel uncomfortable and stuff, but it was, I f it was a little more like my focus... And, like, now I think my focus is more on, like, create, like I, creating this really good horror experience rather than just, like, being a aggressively dark, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, here, here's actually um, a question, just because you've sort of been varied in how you actually even tackle um, game dev. You've been a solo dev, you're currently working with new blood on Gloomwood that's sort of, um, mm -hmm. like what you said, you're focusing primarily on doing more collaborative projects for this year. I, mm -hmm. I have a suspicion that you might also be working with Red XP on something. Mm, I'm not saying anything. There we go. <laughs> uh huh. As soon as you're like, yeah, I can't, I was like, who, oh, yeah. Oh um, no, that that wasn't even that you you would never in a million years guess the project that I'm that I'm talking about with what I. Uh, but um, I mean, you could be working on something with them because you have. I mean, worked. I could be. Could there be. are several projects this year. Yeah, and you mentioned there were several, and I don't think I'm going to be able to guess like the the main central one. No, but and no one is. I don't think anyone could guess what it is. It's very exciting though. I'll have some questions about Dread XP later, by the way. Okay. But, um, which style of workflow do you ultimately prefer, and was it much of an adjustment process for you between working solo and working with other people? Um, I definitely prefer working on my own. Um, and not. I also like working with other people, but it's a different sort of thing. Um, the st stuff that I find... Um, most creatively fulfilling is just working on my own on things um and yeah there is a adjustment to working on a team um and i think the biggest thing for me is just letting go of the mental responsibility of the entire project if that makes sense because like with gloomwood there's a whole bunch of people working on gloomwood and i'm not even the main person the main person is dylan and I'm just kind of there as like the uh, helper develop dev, you know. Um, and it's just a completely different mindset from what I've, how I've worked since I was, you know, since, since I was like 11, 12, <laughs> um, where I don't have to think about every single element of this project because there are other people who are thinking about those elements. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's definitely a change. 
So in, in that case, I guess, what's been your most humbling experience in so far as a game development? Has it been stuff that you've come across while solo or while working as a team? Or are there like experiences I, in both that have stood out? Uh, I think the whole thing is, I mean, it's the, the more I, the, the more years that pass, the less sure I am about really anything in game development and the more I'm just like, you know, like when, back when I was starting out making the horror games and stuff, I kind of, it's embarrassing to say now, but I kind of had this idea that I was, you know, hot shit. You know, I was like, I'm, I'm making these really uh, cerebral horror games and these other, these other games that people are, are giving attention instead don't deserve it as much. And really, you know, stupid stuff like that, which I don't think at all now. Um, and yeah, just as the years have gone on, the more I'm just like, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of making games and people seem to like them, I guess. And I hope that continues. Uh, and I think probably, I don't know, there's been a lot of humbling experiences, but the one that comes to mind in recent memory is how uh, I was actually, um, I was actually in favor of passing on Ultra Kill at New Blood. Um, I when we got the uh, initial sort of pitch demo for it, I played it and I was like, I no, I'm not into this. I don't think it's very good. Um, that was a very uh, bad opinion. <laughs> <as it turned laughs> out. Um, and yeah, I've yet that, to play uh, that, but it's been on my radar. Well, it's it's just more popular than you know. I don't know how much how crude we can get on this this channel, but like it's it's very popular and I'm extremely I'm not monetized. <laughs> I'm okay. not monetized, and I doubt I ever will be. Okay, well it, it's I mean it's like it's I think the highest rated FPS on Steam right now, and it's you know super popular and stuff. So that was I think about that every so often. It's like wow, that was not a that was not a good call on my part. <laughs> Like, as a separate tangent in, in entirely here, or maybe not a separate one, I don't know if you you ended up going later on and being super stressed about this, but how do you mm -hmm. manage game development-related stress? Like, is there something specific you have to do to manage that on top of everything else? Uh, I don't know, and if someone does know, I would love for them to tell me. <laughs> um, I, the answer is you don't, and it just... Uh, eats away at you and then you have mental breakdowns every few years um if it helps <laughs> i i deal with stress and anxiety by baking occasionally it, okay. like literal baking not figurative baking um, yeah not okay yeah um, yeah i don't know brownies I mean, are great they trick you into being happy mm, you, you yeah. might gain a few pounds if you if you trend towards that but like you bake an entire ass tray of brownies and you just store them in your fridge and like the act of baking them is nice that smell of the chocolate maybe a little cinnamon mm -hmm. if you cinnamon also tricks your brain into being happy it's all it okay. is you're just chemically tricking yourself yeah. into being happy and you, when you're feeling a little bad you eat one of the brownies yeah yeah that seems like a good idea <laughs> i mean there's there's just innumerable pitfalls along like before um before i i really had a career it was the the stress was okay when i finish this is it just gonna go out into the void and no one will ever play it uh then before dusk the stress was like oh my gosh uh, the you know the games aren't making as much money and they're not reviewing as well and no one will cover them and i you know and then after dusk the stress turned more into uh you know the whole imposter syndrome like wow i really do not deserve all of this and oh God. then like oh my gosh how am i gonna follow this up like is my is that just the high point of my life now and it's downhill from here and um in addition to all just the minutiae where it's like oh today the engine has decided that it's not going to i don't know bake the light maps properly and you have to solve that and it's stressful and frustrating or like oh suddenly now we have a week to get this done for the release and nothing's working you know oh god um <laughs> I mean, I've yeah, done programming, so, I sort of like understand some of the issues where it's like you change a single thing and like it's just a chain reaction of everything breaks from you patching one thing. 
Yeah, and it's a nightmare in Gloomwood because um, not only is it an extremely complicated game behind, under the hood, uh, but there's also like multiple people involved with it. So, it, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think as you as you continue making games and working at it like you start to get an idea of how to manage certain types of stress but at least for me there's there has yet to be a point where it's like ah yeah i'd know how to handle this it's always you know some new challenge presents itself um new as far as ways what... to panic yeah pretty much <laughs> uh <laughs> that's, that's, yeah that's a good way to put it uh, um yeah so i i think that's this has probably been a pretty good snapshot of like what's behind the game so i suppose this is like a good part to seek into like where i normally talk about the most recent games you're working on but and i will get to that like i entirely intend to but there are some questions about your body of works that i'd like to tackle we've tackled some of it already but yeah. um one of the big ones is you've done boomer shooters, uh, minimalist yeah. exploratory horror. There's the D make, like I said, and there's the immersive sim now with a stealth focus. Uh, Gloom. Yeah. Is there a specific genre you actually? No, you already answered that. You you do gravitate towards FPSs, correct? Yeah, that's really my main uh, main source of enjoyment. That, Not only one though. That said. Are there some genres you still intend on tackling at some point? Mm, I have always wanted to make a proper, like, first-person point-and-click game. Um, the huh. problem there is that those games do not do well currently. Um, so it, it would have to be, like, something that was undertaken entirely as a passion project. Just something um, you do on the side? Yeah, and I've... I've worked on one thing for a little while but hasn't haven't finished it yet um and yeah really i, I have too many so many ideas it's hard to decide which one to focus on uh, a lot of the time so i mean that that's fair enough i i sort of get that especially since you mentioned like the adhd thing you have the things you fixate yeah. on and then if something becomes your the new hotness as far as your fixation things just sort of get boxed for later you're like i want to do this but i gotta do this first yeah exactly and incidentally that's why i really like making shorter games because i have a about a maybe maximum 10 month window before uh, my brain decides it's done focusing on something <laughs> for, on, on a project. So here is a question then, though. Um, so genre aside, you had um, Dusk, which had this minimalistic approach to dialogue, but mm -hmm. a number of your other titles are very prose-centric. Like, even Iron Lung had an update that sort of brought a whole bunch of lore yeah. to the forefront and made it a lot more nightmarish than what it already was. <laughs> right. Um, because of this pro's focus, was it difficult to dial things back for Dusk? And do you have more that you want to write about in regards for that title? Um, it was not hard at all, no, because I, I just got done making, like, four similar, like, narrative-driven horror games within, what, I think a year and a half? That um, sounds about right. So, yeah, it was... So I was, like, really excited to do something gameplay-focused, where story was just uh, taking a backseat. And in fact, um, in Dusk, almost all of the actual overt story, like the lore and the, like, the end boss dialogue and all that, um, that was actually written by Dave Oshry. Huh. Um, he's it's the the game is actually story wise sort of co written between us, um, and he did most of that, and I was mostly responsible for like the um, coming up or you know the journey of the game, I guess you'd say, like the st and the sort of environmental storytelling and all that. Um, so yeah, no, I did I did not find that difficult at all, and really I personally pr don't have any interest in revisiting dusk in a story sense because most of that really isn't mine 
anyway, you know, that's that was sort of Dave's vision for where the story went and stuff. Um, so the world, we, we have sort of joint custody of the world, and if we were to revisit that, I would, you know, the, the story and stuff, I would rely on him for, <laughs> probably, because that was kind of his in the first place. In that case, just what was the most difficult thing to translate into environmental storytelling as far as, like, the stuff he laid out for you? I'm not sure, actually, because the, the process for it was really sort of through written in a like very iterative where we had no idea where the story was going to go when we started the game and really it was like i would make these levels and have this idea of like okay here's sort of what this implies about the world and everything and then we you know have that level and then sometimes he'd be like oh you know now here's this this is what where the story is going um and it was just sort of written as we made the levels and as the game grew. So there was, I don't think there was ever really a situation where it was like, Dave has this idea and it's really hard to then imply that with a level because usually it went the other way around. So it's more of an organic growth from onwards. The ending wasn't even really yeah. written out when you were doing episode one or anything. Oh no, definitely not. I mean, I, I had my own, like, st when I started Dusk, I had a story in mind that was very different from where the game ended up going. Um, it was, like, a lot more sort of sh stalker Shadow of chernobyl -y. Um And I had always kind of figured that at the very end, the in some way, the big threat was going to be, like, the, um, the whole world itself was sort of alive in a, in a sense. Um, there wasn't ever going to be like a near Lethotep boss or, or anything like that. But as we were working on it and stuff, you know, that all changed. It was, yeah, very organic and very iterative. He's our good friend, just concerned about the progress we make. You know, just passing <laughs> on knowledge. No. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. such a friend. <laughs> uh, I, I actually fucking love that reveal at the end. It's only yeah. me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that Dave Dave gets all the credit for that. That was his um that was his idea to uh, that whole that entire um that entire scene and how that all progressed. And like the small hints all the way throughout that episode of like what you're coming across cuz you start coming yeah. across the nicknames a whole bunch earlier and it's just like, "Oh, that's neat. It's a nice little Lovecraft reference." And it's like, "Oh, no, it's not just a reference." Yeah. Here. With the, when it when it came around to episode three, um, I remember that being a thing where Dave was like, "Okay, let's, uh, you know, I think it's we're gonna it's near Lethotep. Like that would make the most sense. He's he's the big bad." Um, and so then we started leaving around that yeah that literal text from um, his nickname. A dream of yeah. What, what was that? Is that I dream think of the. Uh, Oh, I just like dream called? something of Kadath. Yeah, that one. I think that's where that all's from, if I remember correctly. I have a horrible uh, name for his memories, and I used to like read, um, like, in acts of my bedtime stories of Lovecraft. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but like, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I thought it was sort of interesting for like the whole lead-in to that yeah it's in, uh, foreshadowing it i also just like the fact that like it, it ends in this climatic boss battle and then it's just like oh you thought you won spoilers yeah. <laughs> sorry but um yeah the way the that real boss though I, I mean but even beyond that of like here's the real boss it's like oh you thought you could kill Myrlotep through rocket launchers and bullets you idiot Oh, yeah, yeah. Nope, just a test. Yeah, no, uh, that was kill an older god. honestly a fantastic little twist there. Like, it's a little bit of a gut punch, but it's very fitting genre-wise as the game sort of leaned away from, like, pulpy horror and started getting that, that bigger occult and sort of unpleasant undertone to it as it goes yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, here is another little lore question, though. We're switching games again, but okay. um, given the sheer breadth of information that you added in the Iron Lung update, does that lay the foundation for a, a future 
bit of unpleasantness set in that universe since you've already had games sort of sharing a universe before um potentially yeah uh there's even before iron lung was a thing there was a game i was planning in that universe that would be fairly different uh i don't know if that will ever come to fruition but there are several other ideas for possible follow-ups to iron lung that may or may not ever be a thing just it, depending is one of them planned to be a point and click is that is that the no. universe the point and click oh <laughs> no actually um yeah there's there's a bunch of ideas i have some of them are more like here's a direct you know it's iron lung but in a different location i i don't know about that but um others are like it's just set in the same universe but it's a very different sort of game different time period or different sort of game um probably around the same time period not i i've thought about like briefly about you know would it be cool to have something set before the quiet rapture or like during it um i don't know if that would end up happening the it, part where it's you don't tell people like it's the same universe and then the quiet rapture happens and then they realize it's the same universe yeah, that's, that's true that would be pretty cool i don't know there's like innumerable possibilities um the trickle just and and there is also the possibility that there's never another game um set in that universe i don't know it just i don't want to do anything in like anything iron lung related that is just sort of token it's like oh let's do another sequel because it was popular like if i do something else it's be i want it to be because it's something that i really want to do and that is i feel like really would add to it rather than detracting from it that'd be like fun memorable and feel worthwhile yeah, and also because so much of the game is, and the universe around it is, like, the appeal is the mystery. Um, it would be really easy to accidentally pull a Prometheus and just, you know, over-explain things and make them less cool. Um, so, you know, that's always a consideration when when thinking about, like, an Iron Lung follow-up is what sort of stories could I tell here that would still keep the stuff sort of behind the scenes that should stay behind the scenes. Make use of the universe without explaining it to the point that it's mundane. Yeah, but also not get, it fall into, not get into the thing of, like, having all of these follow-ups, and it's always still nothing else is ever expanded on and it's just like i don't know it's it's a tough balance i think that's fair that definitely explains why like if there is something coming it'll be probably a bit probably a bit what uh, was that? i said that that would probably explain why if there is something that ends up coming part of that universe it'll probably be a bit until it it arrives yeah probably i mean there's there's other stuff i'd like to do um I mean, heck, I've, I've got some other uh, Chop Goblin stuff that I'd like to do if possible. I was about to ask about that. Yeah. Um, which... well, we, can, we can move into Chop Goblins. If... Let, let's go to Chop Goblins then, because All I right. actually did recently go through that game and cover it. So um, how exactly did Chop Goblins come about, since it's, uh, you know, a lot more lighthearted than the majority of your releases? I actually, when I was going through it, part of the review is... Um, when the fucking they burst out in the car, I, I highlighted <laughs> yeah. that moment, and then the Gremlins theme kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, funny tidbit about that is I actually designed almost all of Chop, like made almost all of Chop Goblins before I had seen either Gremlins film. What? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, I mean, I knew kind of the the basic the meme sort of the, the creatures run amok and that's what it was riffing on um and then i ended up watching both gremlins films and i was like these are awesome i'm glad that i am riffing on this uh but yeah so i'm Top so Goblins... glad i included that little music riff that when the fucking car emerges because yeah. that was the perfect quintessential like gremlins moment in that game yeah <laughs> yeah like them on the uh snow plow or whatever yeah like, yeah yeah and that's why that's what i was thinking of when like you come to the car and it's just loaded with chop goblins coming <laughs> in and then the music from gremlins came the yeah. yeah um so that 
uh, is probably anyone who knows me in real life would say that's more sort of who I am as a person than the horror stuff. Uh, like I'm, I'm much that that's a little more actually my real personality. Uh, is that sort of just really stupid, goofy, <laughs> you know, go goofiness? Um, and let's see, how did that come about? So there were a couple steps. The first one was, I think this was even before Iron Lung, I was kind of in a, a funk um, and still trying to, it took me, it took me a, a few years to get, uh, get past the whole Dusk releasing thing and figure out what do I do now? Um, and at some point during that time, I was just sort of in the, yeah, like in this funk and just sort of letting my imagination run wild to see if I could come up with some sort of idea that I felt like would catch. Um, and I was like half asleep and just suddenly the, the name, like the idea of like chop goblins came into my head of like, this is a, this is like a schlock eighties series and there would have to be like you know eight of them or something and they're just these like puppet master or something like that where it's just there's tons of these horrible low budget movies or whatever about the chop goblins and the the first one is like chop goblins and then it's chop goblins no mercy or something like that. and just Revenge all these you know, of the really chop goblins yeah just all these really stupid titles and chop so goblins, that was the idea chop harder <laughs> Yeah, and that was the idea that popped into my head in this sort of half-asleep state, and I just thought the name and the concept were funny. So I wrote that down in my big list of things and would keep mentally coming back to it every so often. And then uh, after Iron Lung, I was uh, just looking for games on Steam to play. Uh, like indie games, un sort of unheard of indie games, and this one came through my discovery queue called, oh, what is it called? Cave Explore. Let me look, look it up real quick. Cave, Cave Crawler. That's it. I want to get it name right in case anyone goes to play it. Uh, this little game called Cave Crawler, which is free, and all it is is this really simple little uh, 2D side scroller, which normally I'm not really into, but. Something about it was like the simplicity of it, and um, I think it even talked about on the store page. Yeah, on the store page, it's just like this really short description. Where it's just, hey, this is a 2D side scrolling platformer, and there's like five levels, and blah blah blah, and it's really short. And I was like, okay, heck yeah, I would that that sounds awesome actually to play, grab this game, just play like sit down for 20 minutes and play through a full game. That sounds great i'll grab this and so i did and i played it and it just kind of struck a chord with me this idea of what if you like having a game and it's just really short and compact not like short as in this is a proof of concept demo but like you take this experience and you compact it down into a single sitting like that was really appealing to me and it, you know, it wasn't long before that I made the jump of like, well, you know, I love FPS games. What if there was an FPS like this? And I, it, uh, then it didn't take long from that to be like, you know what would be perfect for this? Chop Goblins. <laughs> that Chop Goblins concept. That would be the perfect thing to take and make into this little bite-sized FPS. And it was always conceptualized as like, this could be a, like, this would be a series too. I figured I would make the first one, and I made the engine and stuff all really nice and, um, not the engine, but like the code foundation and everything, all like nice and really open to being adapted, like having new levels made and new enemies and new weapons and stuff. And I figured I'll make this little one and I'll put it out there just because I think this is a cool idea. And if it does, if it does terribly, okay, it's whatever. It only took me a few months. And if it does well, well, maybe I'll make some more. Um, so we're now at the point where it's done pretty well. It's done decently. And uh, I already have like four other potential games planned out. I don't know if I'll end up making them, but I would love to do at least a sequel to Chop Goblins because I've got other other ideas that I think would be really fun and silly. 
would they be like DLC expansions to the first game or separate games and like would they all still be FPSs or would they all just sort of be bite-sized thematically chop goblins carrying that that zany sort of destructive humor but possibly genre hop or change up the formula um kind of both actually I do have some free DLC planned um just so a little bit of not anything huge just a little bit of extra content for people uh at one point i did kind of think about what if i just made a bunch of paid dlc for this i don't know i don't think i'm gonna do that though i think a sequel would just be a sequel really like a separate game another another five dollar game um i've got several similar fps's planned using the same code framework and everything uh and I also was like, to me, the the concept behind it is really, really flexible. The concept behind like Chop Goblins is really flexible. Like it is just so stupid and so not based in any sort of logic. You can just do anything with it. So and especially saying... since one of the core conceits is like it's short. So it's like, I could go off and make a short 20 minute little side scroller Chop Goblins game. Or a or micro like RTS a, where we play as the Chop Goblins destroying yeah, the city. Or, <laughs> yeah, something like over, Overlord or something like that with the Chop... Like, there's innumerable things you could do with it. Um, but primarily, at least in the near future, what I'd like to do is I'd, I want to do at least one sequel um, time, you know, time and, and ADD permitting. Fair enough. Um, that actually answered a fair amount of what I wanted to know about that. I guess other than that, I'd just be curious about like, even for just like a, a sequel following more along the lines of the first one, is there anything specifically you were wanting to introduce or change things up with mechanically that you didn't get to hmm. do in the, the current iteration? Um, most of, most of what I did in the first one, I think is pretty much what I wanted to do. I think one one difference would be um, in a sequel, I would like to not focus entirely around, but do a little bit more with the idea of you using your melee and gun. Um, I think in like the, the fir very first level of Chop Goblins, it's kind of cool that you have the flintlock and it's a slow reload, so you can like shoot one guy and then you have to go stab another guy and you know switch between the two and i'd like to do a little bit more with that because after after that at the first level in in chop goblins it's like you just get pretty much automatic weapons and so you don't ever really care about the dagger anymore i mean the dagger um upgrade actually still keeps it relevant that's true yeah that was kind of my attempt later on in development to make the dagger a bit more like something you would you potentially use um, I, I think it was really good levels. for melee enemies like if you could force someone down a corridor you could just stab them and save ammo that way yeah um, yeah yeah um I, I think the thing about chop goblins i really enjoyed the most was just sort of the level design is that like especially the first level when you realize how porous and how many secrets there were tucked away inside of it Mm -hmm. Um, like, I think it was my third playthrough of the first level where I ended up, I think, finding all the secrets and, like, the, uh, like, the key. I went around struggling mm, trying to find yeah. the key and, like, the secrets all made sense ultimately. Like, you weren't actually having to, like, hump walls, um, looking, like, that's the thing I appreciated us, too. The secrets made sense ultimately. Like, there were indicators, either audio cues or like visual cues that would sort of indicate like there's something here as long as you kept your eyes peeled for like buttons or chop gums has like the little x's you can shoot yeah <laughs> yeah i wanted to make uh make it that it's something you could go through once and you wouldn't feel like you would missed out on any anything important but it's also <clears throat> excuse me it's also something you could replay and look for you know there are some secrets they're not marked which is a um difference from dusk because i wanted to steer away from that idea of like oh you need to 100 percent the level and get all the secrets and have it more just be like there's some hidden stuff you can find if you really want to um if you want to replay it and stuff you know, you know i wanted to make sure that like if you're a person who you spent your five dollars and you expect 
like you want to get more than just 20 or 30 minutes out of it it's fun to replay and there's stuff you can you know, stuff you can find on replaying too oh right i need to apologize i forgot about this i i i, yeah. I think i said it in the chop Goblin review but um okay so you know the grease puzzle uh yeah yeah i brute forced it really yep I mean, it yeah, was easier than um, the one where I brute forced 8,000 combinations. Um, Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I couldn't remember the number for this thing, and um, I don't remember what it was. You're like, I guess, air it's like a clock-themed horror game where you're in a campsite sort of free-roaming. Um, anyways, there's a padlock, okay. and it had like four or five comb- I think it had four combinations. Um, you know, okay. with like 10 numbers. I just couldn't remember and I couldn't be bothered to double back to go and do this. So I just sat there like at this combination lock. 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000. You couldn't be bothered to backtrack, but you'd sit there for well, hours doing this? Nah, that wasn't an hour. It took me like 15 minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> it took me yeah, like I, 15 I... or 20 minutes. I was sitting there talking to chat while I was doing this, okay. drinking coffee, <laughs> and just going through hell. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did know before release that, that the Chop Goblins one would be pretty easy to brute force, but that was okay, because that was... Um, I, I, I knew that would probably be something some people did, but honestly, the point of that puzzle is not to stump you. It's more just to... Um, well, first of all, give a, a little bit of, like, not not necessarily downtime, but, like, time where you're just sort of in, you're not, you're not moving forward, you know, a little bit of variety, and also to throw uh, something at you that is more than just, um, ass- more than just shooting guys. I assumed so, the again, puzzle was behind me in the lava room, but I was like, uh, I'm half dead. It's actually on the floor. Um, if you go around to the the different um, like the, the pavilion things, if you oh, go God. around to those and look in the floor, that's the symbols. Well, but I'm yeah, an idiot. Like, honestly, <laughs> no. But honestly, brute forcing is it is a is a completely viable and perfectly fine for that puzzle. I was just glad that every time I brute forced, it didn't spawn enemies. Cause like the first time I did it, yeah. I'm like, am I gonna? Is this gonna be me just like gradually going through my ammo? And I was like, no, okay, we're <laughs> yeah. just gonna sit here and do this. I'm gonna like yeah. find my inner peace. There's only like I think 32 combinations or something. Like, yeah, there aren't many. Yeah, like I said, it was really. It's not there to really stump you or anything. It's just there to be like a little, little challenge that's a bit different. Every time, every time I don't remember the combination or I haven't written something down, my if <laughs> anyone who's viewing me is just like, really, this is what you're doing? <laughs> I'm like, I've done worse, done worse. Oh, uh, yeah, no, it's it's rough though, and you're like brute forcing like ten thousand combinations, and you start at zero, and the answers in like the eight thousands. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, my mother-in-law, my my wife's family has this. I don't even know how you describe it. There's certain um, uh, obstinance to them. Uh, so I remember my my uh, mother-in-law played this game on the Wii called Safe Cracker, um, and she encountered something where she, instead of figuring out the code for it, she was ju- she just decided to brute force it like that, and it was a huge number of permutations. Um, <laughs> And then she ended up missing a number and couldn't get it open. <laughs> <gasps> oh no! <laughs> yeah. So I think I think that was the end of her playthrough of it, if I remember correctly. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, no, like yeah. I have to make notes because I'm like, okay, I have to take a break to get some water. And I'm just like, jots down a single number. I'm like, oh yes, I'm in four thousand now. Fantastic. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. But yeah, that's my my Chop Goblins questions. So, last thing, before we get into Gloomwood things. Alright. How involved was the work related to co-producing DreadX Collection The Hunt? Um, less than making my own game, uh, but more than doing nothing, <laughs> I'd say. So I, um, I picked out all of the... Uh, all of the developers for that collection. Like, I, I handpicked them, and I, um, between Ted, the 
uh, Dread X guy, between Ted and I, um, we sort of agreed on a theme based on, like, I wanted to do something that covered a lot of the themes that I like in my own stuff, where it's like, I like, um, well, I guess it's not really the hub in game my was own yours, stuff, right? but like, no, 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 I, I actually wasn't involved with that in much at all. Um, except for writing the music. <laughs> I, I did oh, the you music did the music for that? For that? I actually really yeah. liked that one because it was very, like, uh, the thing-ish. Yeah, that was... Uh, so I, I did work on that a little bit. Mostly that was Ted and um, Nate who worked on that. Fantastic. Um, like, Ted designed the whole thing and wrote the story and everything. Um, but yeah, so I, like, you know, determined sort of the, the theme of, like, oh, I really like Arctic Horror. I really, you know, I, I want it to be all fps's um that was that was my stipulation because um well they're not all fps they're all shooters um that was my stipulation because i felt like camera game yeah and also one of them's um third person too um but they're all they're all shooters in different ways so um i wanted to do that because i thought it was like that's kind of unique in indie horror uh there aren't actually that many FPS indie horror games, at least compared with not FPS indie horror games. And I felt like if I were looking on Steam and I saw it was like, hey, horror collection and it's all first person shooters, I would buy that immediately. Um, and then the actual games themselves, like what sort of games they were and everything, that was entirely up to the developers. Um, and they they presented me with their ideas um and i would you know gave maybe a little bit of like directional feedback but for the most part i was just like i want you to make something that you'd want to make just within these really loose guidelines and then uh every so often i would check in and play the builds of the games and um just sort of give it my opinions and advice for what could be improved about them. And I really tried not to make e every game a David game or be like, you know, you should change exactly this because that's how I make games. Like, I really tried to make it so um, the games were very much the developer's own games and I was just there sort of giving like guidelines ideas for like, okay, how, well, more like, how can we make this the best sort of of this type of game that it could be mm -hmm. um and that's why you have things like um rose of meat which is just that fucking game abject insanity you know i would never think to design anything like that but you know that was uh i brought him on knowing exactly what he he'd make and i wanted you know something insane from him um and i was just sort of there being like uh maybe let's improve you know the navigation in this area and, blah, blah, and fucking weird witch um, things yeah so yeah those those things are messed up um so there was that and then i also i wrote the the score for the hub area and also for um which game was it i think it was the uh the camera game what was that called again uh um, ocula yeah whatever I, I forget the name. God help me, I can't remember. Um, I know what yeah. you're talking about, though. Yeah, it, I wrote I wrote the music in that too because he needed some music, and I think I might have done a sound effect too. I can't remember, but I, so I did a little bit of like in the trenches work, just if it was needed. Um, but yeah, that that was basically what I did on that project, um, and it was really cool. Uh, I all of the all of the devs that I worked with were awesome. I was extremely jealous of some of the game, like, uh, Uktana 64. Uh -huh. game. Yeah. yeah. Here is a incredibly good horror developer. And, um, I was je like jealous of that. I'm like, holy crap, this is basically a squirrel stapler, but like better, like better realized. Um, I, okay, but, I mean, all the stapler. games were awesome. And <laughs> thank you. God all the coming. games were Yeah. All the games were awesome in their own ways. I think that one was sort of my my personal favorite, just in terms of like it was like, man, I wish I had made this. <laughs> it could have both been in the same universe for the sort of the vibe they have. It's just Uktana's like yeah. a little bit more hillbillyish, I guess. It's just yeah. like 
crack a beer, kill some animals, uh, don't think too hard on everything you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, if if both games were to get a it get like standalone versions, I would 100% want to do a bundle with him or with with them. I'm sorry, uh, of of Uktana, however you pronounce it, and um, Squirrel Stapler. That'd be a fucking trip. Uh, yeah. The fucking the goddess coming thing, by the way, like it took a couple seconds for that to hit me because like. I was looking in the distance, and it took that mm-hmm. little bit of time for me to, like, wheel around. Mmm. That is probably the best any- ending to anything I've ever made. Like, the the God is Coming chorus. I'm so happy with that. Yeah, it's no, just... that was good. And, and, like, honestly, the whole thing of, like, the body moving around, too, is, like... <laughs> yeah. Uh. Life. I remember telling, um... My wife, the um, the uh, the the premise for that, and she's used to me, like, and so she's just like David. <laughs> it's like no, that's horrible. Like you can't do that. And I'm like, I'm gonna do that though. It's great. It's gonna be awesome. Um, and then that actually ended up being her favorite game that I've made, uh, Squirrel Stapler, because she she uh, played it on stream actually, and she's just like, yeah, this is. Because she knows me, it's like, yeah, this like this is your sense of humor. I also really like the notes, like the the the, the squirrel oh, yeah. facts and everything. Like at first, yeah. I was like, are these actual squirrel facts? And then it like they keep happening. I'm like, no, no, I can't believe I yeah. thought these early ones are actually squirrel facts. How fucking no, stupid the, uh, do I so have the, to be? So the the early ones are. It starts it starts out with real squirrel facts, and then they gradually change into lobster facts. And then they change into um, just, you know, depravity. And the, the lobster fact thing was actually my wife's idea. Uh, she was because I I was like talking about it. Yeah, so there's like squirrel facts around stuff. She's like, what if it? You just start putting in lobster facts because lobsters <laughs> are super messed up. Like, like all of those. All of there's a bunch of the like. Uh, urinating out of their eyeballs or whatever that's all like very true for lobsters <laughs> like they're really <laughs> weird creatures <laughs> jesus christ i mean i guess that keeps them moist or whatever <laughs> under yeah, the ocean or something yeah uh fuck okay um i guess the only other question i'd have dread x related wise is um do we have more contributions from you to look forward to on that front even if you can't talk uh, about the genre. Like Dreadx collections? Yeah. I don't know, to be, to be honest. Um, me doing stuff for other collections hasn't really been talked about. And to be honest, as, um, as great an experience as it was working with Dreadx on the those three collections, um, I'm kind of at a point now where I'm not sure I'd want to... Uh, work on something like that and have someone else publishing it just now that um now that iron lung is you know done really well and chop goblins has done really well at this point i'm like i would rather just make this stuff on my own and publish it on my own i mean yeah um, like jack septic i noticed you <laughs> yeah and have it you know all 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 under my own control um again nothing you know dread x was was great to work with on that stuff it's just that when i think about um, like like Squirrel Stapler, for instance, I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool if that were just on Steam. Like I had just if I had just made Squirrel Stapler and put it on Steam itself, uh, not part of a collection. Um, and so yeah, going forward, I kind of just feel like I'd rather publish all this stuff on my own and um, cut out the middleman in a way. I mean, that's definitely fair. It helped me discover you, because, like, I'd heard of Dusk, but I'd never actually dived into your stuff until, like, the Dreadx thing sort of set me on a path for you, and then I started going through your bodies of work, like, backwards. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I don't have any regrets about doing those. Um, and it was, you know, Dreadx offering the opportunity is the reason that those games even happen. Like, I wouldn't have ever come up with the idea for Squirrel Stapler if I wasn't trying to think up something to do for the collection. Um, it's just that, you know, thinking for the future, I'm like, eh, mm-hmm. what, what makes the most sense for me is probably more just working on my own. 
when it's when it's my own project. All right, so I, I've sort of delayed this enough. Um, I figure now it seems like a good time to start talking about the project that you're helping to work on, Gloomwood. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear you describe it first off and what you're aiming to accomplish with it, at least in regards to your part of it. Sure. Uh, well, Gloomwood is a alternate history, sort of surreal Victorian um, horror-adjacent game that is best described as sort of a mix of classic immersive sims like Thief or System Shock 2 or Deus Ex um, with survival horror games like Resident Evil. It's sort of a mid-ground between those two set in this moody Vict uh, Victorian uh, place. like <laughs> place where stuff's crazy. Um, and, uh, let's see, what, yeah, it's, um, uh, I don't, <laughs> it's one of those deals where there's so much to talk about, I'm not even sure where to start. Um, I'm mostly, so, so I am, I am working on Gloomwood, but I'm mostly, like, the second developer. I've helped out with a lot of different things, um, but the game is primarily the brainchild of um, Dylan Rogers, who's um, Taffer King on Twitter, and is obs uh, obsessed with all things Thief and Immersive Sim. Um, and it just so happens that I have very similar, uh, very similar taste. So, you know, it works out. Um, but I've done a, I've done a lot of work on like determining the aesthetic direction of the game, at least starting out, um, helping to design sort of the the game the game design itself, like the direction we're going of of this mix between classic survival horror uh, values and immersive sim elements um, and stuff like that. So if you were you part of the project from sort of its inception or were you pulled in a bit later and as far as you know how did the project come to be um so he has been working on gloomwood since i think probably even before i started work on well start started work on the the dusk that me and um you guys ended up seeing it, he hasn't been working on it since he's been 15 but <laughs> um yeah, so he, he's been working on it forever, uh, but the original version was... Oh, you, you wouldn't recognize it as Gloomwood. A different uh, It was like a... Yeah, it was still the same setting and sort of vibe, that like uh, weird surreal Victorian thing. Um, but it was like a pixel art roguelike sort of game. Hmm. Um, it was still a first person game, but it was like all the... like. Uh, really crunchy pixels and it was like a roguelike and everything looked different um the game is kind of we know it now started uh let's see i think it, it was like taking shape while i was finishing up with dusk like in the, like that year um and then uh let's see I'm trying to, and that that was when it was sort of more of like a uh, Victorian System Shock 2, in a way. Mm -hmm. It was, it, for a while, actually, Gloomwood was not going to be a stealth game, or at least not, not in the sense that it is now. Um, it was going to be like, you couldn't really sneak around enemies, you just had to pick and choose how you, uh, how you engage them, very much like System Shock 2. Um, and then after Dusk, uh, I, Dylan and I were friends, we'd kind of met through Twitter, and it turned out we had very similar interests, so we were talking a lot, and he, toward the end of Dusk, um, ended up helping out with something. I think he, he helped out with some coding stuff, um, or maybe, I, I think some save system stuff, and then he also helped me design the boss encounter for Nier Lethotep. Huh. Um, he, he helped conceptualize sort of the arena and stuff. Um, Maybe some other stuff that I'm forgetting. Like, he was, you know, a friend and was around helping with things. And I uh, was sort of scheming, well, it would be really great if um, Gloomwood, uh, game, as in its that form, it was like, it'd be really great if this was a New Blood game. And I kind of pushed for that to happen. And it 
ended up becoming a new blood game and um it was just natural that since dylan and i were friends since i was just coming off of dusk and i was really i love immersive sims and i'd always wanted to make one and i love survival horror games and i'd always wanted to make one so it was really a just natural fit that i would um i would assist with it so you said it didn't necessarily start out with a uh, stealth orientation and the like so how did your yeah. experience with stealth in dusk impact how you chose to address it or even implement it in gloomwood uh i would say very little um because there's a little bit of stealth in dusk uh at one point there was going to be more but it was like it it made the ai too exploitable um and really that when gloomwood when we started talking about well maybe this should take a little bit more from thief um dylan really was the one who took you know took point on that he's combed through the thief source code and stuff like that and really gotten and played just innumerable hours of thief and thief mods and stuff and just uh focused in really hard on what works about this and what doesn't work and what would we want to replicate so that's really his um you know that was really him in that case like from your observations of like going through it and its progression what do you think has been the most interesting innovation he's made in so far as the stealth for gloomwood oh there's a lot that it it may not look like it uh from just playing it but that game under the hood is so complicated <laughs> um like the i i think that him in unity coding his own sound propagation system that works very that works the same as thieves is incredible um same with the having not not just you're in the dark so you're hidden you're in the light so you're not hidden but having the same sort of light gem system and like he i don't know i think there's a lot that he's done to take all the stuff about about thief that is really cool and remake it in a completely different engine that i think is really incredible sort of hopping back over to like a, a matter of your particular contribution you mentioned you helped a bit with like the aesthetic elements for the yeah. game's current iteration what influenced the art style that you are using for the game um so when gloomwood first came came to new blood it was uh sort of painterly style i'd say not not in a really stylized way not like it was using like a post-processing filter to look like a painting or anything but it was it was very hand um hand drawn looking hmm. in the, in the sense that like all of the textures were made in photoshop like drawn in photoshop by dylan um and they were it was a lot more colorful and almost cartoony looking in some ways um and we just ended up we talking about Dave, Dylan, and I all kind of talked about it, and we ended up all coming, we ended up all agreeing that it needed, for the atmosphere we wanted of this, like, plague, you know, foggy, plague-ridden, Victorian sort of setting, it needed to have a grittier look to it. Um, so I started out, this is, at this point, it was just me and Dylan working on the game with Dave producing it. Um, so I started experimenting with what could we do with this to make it grittier but keep the painterly look. Um, and I tried a few things and eventually we were just like, no, it needs the, we need to change the whole art style. Um, it needs to look more d grittier, more, you know, more decayed and, and dark and stuff. Um, and so the first reference point was Thief, since we were moving stuff a lot closer to Thief. Um, and that sort of remained a big touchstone, but we've also brought in, um, l like, well, I, sh I shouldn't say we, I've also brought in elements of, like, uh, Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. That's hey. a game that both, yeah, both Dylan and I love that game. And if you play through the like the cliffs and the fishery and stuff in gloomwood uh you'll see there's a lot of 
Call of Cthulhu in there, and that's very deliberate. Um, and Dylan has a background as a source mapper, and I have a background as a big fan of source stuff. Um, so a lot of the way like we use textures and, and the way the textures are designed for and stuff is kind of source influenced also. Does that also mean there's going to be a lot of um, sort of vertical building? Because that's like a thing that's heavily done in Source because I think it was easier to build vertically than horizontally in it. Um, vertical vertical level design is generally just desirable in a lot of ways. And so especially getting into the city areas, I think that's definitely something that you'll see a lot of. Um, not Not just... Not, not even just because aesthetically we're trying to emulate anything, but just because I think that's going to make for a much more interesting stealth level design, especially once you start getting some other tools that... Sort of gives you more options for navigating around and avoiding fights if you want to avoid them or ambushing people. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it's just cool to climb stuff, too. Like, <laughs> everyone loves climbing things. I remember with the... When we were doing the fishery... Um, the way level design works in Gloomwood is there's a lot of back and forth between Dylan, Dylan and I. Like, um, the fishery is primarily his level that he did the most work on, but I also did a little bit in it. Um, the caves uh, were primarily my level that I worked on, but Dylan also did a, a decent amount of work in them. Cliffside was sort of both of us back and forth. So um, with the fishery, I remember at one point... Uh, we were testing it, and I was like, we really need to make sure you can climb up onto the roof. Like, have rooftop space where you can climb up there and get into trouble on it. Would, it would just be super cool. Can, can you knock people off roofs to their death? Well, you can, um, you can stab them and then throw their body off the roof. There is a... There has been a, um running discussion about whether we would be able to implement any sort of kick functionality um that's not in any way a promise of features to come but it's something that has been discussed and there are reasons for it and reasons for not having it secondary stupid question is leading off this yeah. if you drop an object from a rooftop under onto someone below will it do damage to them like drop? okay yeah that is that is the biggest um gameplay feature that I have been I, I, I have been nagging for for like for a while now <laughs> so it, yes it is going to be a thing I'm really hoping next uh, next big update that we get to put that in because I have been uh, campaigning for that for a while just carrying a bunch of bricks onto a rooftop and hucking them down at people yeah. <laughs> I mean if this like like I said I tend to be pretty just goofy to a stupid extent and i think it would be hilarious if you dropped a, like a metal box on them it just scales their model down and sideways so they just sort of like splat like looney tunes splat. isn't there already something sort of like that if you like crush someone with an elevator um it'll jib them it'll jib them like, but it doesn't yeah. quite pancake them like you would with no a box yeah i i mean that may be a little too goofy for gloomwood but i think it would be also hilarious uh, th that's where you just you put it as a little toggle, so you have like the normal death for a box. Yeah. You just have a little toggle, like if they maybe find like a little note in a pile of bricks or something on a rooftop, and it just unlocks the ability to pancake people and loony <laughs> coyote <t> deaths. <laughs> coyote <laughs> deaths in enabled. Yeah. Oh, that'd actually be fantastic. Um, I think it'd be hilarious. Yeah. So. What's been the hardest challenge when making this game, at least in so far? Light maps. Light maps by a, just miles and miles, it's light maps. Um, because we... So the, the Glimwood demo, if you go back... I don't even know if that's available on Steam anymore. I think it's gone. Um, but if you played that, uh, there were some dynamic light sources, and those were all real-time. Those were all... Uh, and they were a little expensive... Um, and really all of us wanted the thief thing of, uh, like, like in thief, you can, you know, put out a torch, um, and that torch will go out and that it'll stop casting light, but thieves all light maps. That's not, none of the, none of that sort of lighting is real time. Um, and we really wanted to be able to do that. 
Um, and it was one of those deals where it looks obtainable enough, or it looks attainable enough that you are like, oh, I can, we can do this. And then you just start unraveling the, how the complex tangle, it actually is. Yeah, and then, you know, several years later, and you're still, um, like, we're still fighting with that system in different ways, but... Is some of the issue, like, reflective surfaces, or, like, um, how it interacts with, like, people as they move across it, or are there, like, specific... Oh, no, it's it's never interesting practical issues like that. It's always stupid issues like, oh, yeah, for some reason, this object just looks like a checkerboard, and we don't know why, and it's something Unity is doing behind the scenes. Because uh... Unity has no support for switching light maps. Like, our genius-level programmer guy needed to literally create his own like system for doing this um Ooh. like every so every single light source in gloomwood that every single dynamic light, light source that can be turned on and off is its own separate like light map pass um yeah it's crazy it's a it's it's crazy that the system works but we're because it's been uh, such an ordeal. And by the way, if you ever wonder why Gloomwood has uh, taken so long to get from the initial demo to now early access, light map. <laughs> that, that is the reason, because I I kid you not, that probably took a year of project time just working on that uh, all said and done, and it's still something that we struggle with. Um, but we're going to try and make extra sure to have a lot of situations where you can do cool things with the light maps because it's taken like uh in the early access in the fishery you can see that with the lighthouse um how the lighthouse beam will shine onto the level sometimes that's all entirely baked um but that's the that's the light map system at worked i mean that's cool though so here's a question yeah. though it, it's related it might cross over with this again i feel like it likely will but like What's been the most troublesome bugs you've encountered, and what's been the most interesting? At least so far as maybe stuff that mm. lent itself to emergent behavior, possibly. Huh, that's a good question. I mean, like, uh, like I feel like sometimes bugs in, in these sort of games end up becoming features. <laughs> well, the one, this, this may not be the most interesting, but it's the one that's first coming to mind, which is recently... Um, the Huntsmen were given that new uh, charge attack, or not the, the Woodsmen, sorry, were given that new charge attack where they can just run at you with the axe, um, like at, at top speed. Uh, and that has resulted in two hilarious bugs. The first one was, did end up needing to be fixed, because, but essentially what would happen is you were like on a ledge lower than the Huntsmen. So you were like close to him, but in nav mesh terms, in terms of him actually navigating to you, he had to go all the way around somewhere else to actually get to you. So he would see that you're like close and he would start his charge attack and he would just like, like, uh, light road speed runner. dash. Like, yeah, like road runner. Um, that was hilarious. Made for some great gifts, but it was, it needed fixed. The other one that very much did not need fixed and we, kept in because it's amazing is um so there's the one woodsman in the cliffside map who's like in the in, in the barn and he's just chopping away at this meat and like axe goes in blood comes out um so if you make a noise near him he'll stop what he's doing and be like, you know, who made that noise and go investigate and then after he's done investigating he'll go back to chopping the meat and somehow it was it happened so that when he decided to go back it, whenever he would decide to go back to chopping the meat he would do the dash attack so what would happen is you'd have this guy uh walking around outside the barn and he'd be like hmm must have been the wind or whatever and then go ah! just like dash back in and um you know, like condemned to swing back to the chopping the meat, and it was just the funniest thing ever. I guess and that, that would teach players. Yeah, I guess that would teach players. Like, yeah, by the way, they have a dash attack. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But it was just—it was so funny. Um, Can you bait them off cliffs with that? By the way, like if you sidestep, no, no, oh. no. Although, um, could be a thing in the future. I mean, we are always uh, throughout early access. We'll be 
tweaking things and adding in new you know features and stuff like that that makes sense because our approach is that we want to make it so that if you expect something to work a certain way it should or it should yeah like if you're like i intuitively this should happen or whatever like breaking someone that. from the top of the building <laughs> exactly like that that's one of the reasons i've been pushing for that um it's like anything where you're like ah, oh, i think i should be able to solve it this way within reason we want to make sure that that is something you can do so just to, to bounce back to like how this thing works so like the woodsman dash does it essentially calculate like he's supposed to reach you in a certain amount of time and it just cranks his speed to be able to do so is that how like the the roadrunner thing happened or um to be honest i'm not sure because my uh programming contribution to gloomwood has been quite minimal mm -hmm. um because I'm really not a very good programmer, um, so there are other people working on it who are much better than I am, and it would do nobody any good uh, if I touched the code. So most of the programming stuff is stuff I haven't really been involved with. Um, I'm just involved in sort of the, the level design, the, the aesthetics, and the overall game design and all of that not so much the actual coding things. Okay, so we covered interesting bugs and we've sort of talked about the light mapping, but beyond that, what's been the most troublesome bug? Light maps. <laughs> it's just, like, it's just light maps, it's, it's light just maps light. all the way. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm hard pressed to think of anything else that isn't just the light maps screwing something up. Um, although there's certainly been plenty of bugs, but that's really the most troublesome part of Gloomwood. Okay. That and, um, I guess this isn't really a bug, but tuning the AI has been a big trouble, too. Because you'll have the AI do something where, in the code, it makes perfect sense why it happens. But then in that one situation to the player, it seems unfair. So it's like, it's well, like the where code, you have it's to make perfectly fair, but then, yeah. exceptions and etc. to sort of compensate for when these things happen emergently. Yeah, or or decide where we want to strike the balance of like the the AI being smart, but also the player being able to like get away from them in ways that make sense to the player. And mm -hmm. it's it's just it's a huge difficult balance thing. And a lot of that stuff, I guess, I guess what brings that up is that a lot of that stuff are situations where to the player it can look like, oh, this is a bug. and But in the code, it's like, no, this is actually very fair. It just doesn't feel fair in that situation. Like trying to get away from them, but you're making noise. So even if you round a corner, it's still hearing you type thing. Well, it's crazier than that. It's things like, so um, AI in Gloomwood has tons of different viz cones for like um they they have different peripheral vision depending on their alert state so you can get into situations where it's like you this guy doesn't see you but then something makes them slightly more alerted so now you're technically in their peripheral so then it looks like they instantly spotted you and but you know like crazy things like that so do they like have like less of a warm-up state where you have like a second or two to peel back and it just they go alert yeah they have a um so they've got several different alert levels um i'm trying to remember how i think it's around four because they have like they're not alerted at all and then they'll respond to something just here they'll be like oh what was that and that doesn't really what it's... was that noise yeah <laughs> and then they have like a um a state where they're like, no, something is here, and they're searching around and trying to figure it out. Um, I think they might have a st another state below that, but, but then and then there's like the. We we know you're tasting. there. I've seen you. I'm going to murder your ass when I get my hands on you. Yeah. Um, so we you've sort of talked about this like a, a plague ridden town, and I believe the player character themselves is a plague doctor. Or they are a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Does the sickness come into play insofar as, like, is it a thing that'll affect certain regions of the town and the player? I'm trying to think of that one game that you're basically, like, there's three characters, it's a horrible disease. Pathologic. Yes. Is there anything, yeah. like, awful <laughs> that you're going to have to navigate like that, where it's just a nightmare um, later? There are some nightmarish things you'll have to navigate, but they're not really a traditional plague disease like that. Okay, so it's not going to be like the management of 
of resources in that fashion. No. Okay. No, although both Dylan and I really love Pathologic also, and I'm... I still uh, need there's... to actually play... Th I've, I've heard, like, the second one's actually not a bad stepping in point and pretty... No, the second one is a pretty good... As the step... Let's put it this way. The second one is the best stepping in point you are going to get with those games, which is not a very... Like... The whole idea behind them is they're supposed to make you feel really, really stressed and uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah, I've I've heard like they're legendary for doing just that. Yeah, they're <laughs> miserable, stressful, unpleasant experiences. They're great. One day, one day, folks, I, I will probably dive into that and suffer the whole way through. Yeah, and also, um, it's it doesn't get mentioned as much, but um, the void by the same developers is also fantastic. I dived into. I found it really difficult to get into that, but I did dive yep. into it. It is. It. I mean, if anything, I think the void is even more stressful than Pathologic. Yeah. So, <laughs> um. So I guess the only okay. So here's another question. We sort of tackle. That. I was just curious if there was like going to be disease management or that sort of tricky thing that you're going to have to keep in the back of your mind while you're progressing forward. If there is anything, I guess, like, will you have to deal with consequences for your actions affecting the city or possibly making things worse? A la, I guess dishonored or just a way of like tracking like oh you murdered a lot of people everything is going to be more aggressive or fall to ruin like is there going to be anything um yes and no uh we deliberately do not want to have a morality sort of chaos system like dishonored because both of us really hate that system um so there and in gloomwood gloomwood is not designed like thief in the sense that it's th that it's supposed to be viable for you to be like do a non-lethal playthrough or something it's m more like a survival horror game in the sense in that way where it's like you're expected to kill stuff it's um, just so picking a fight with everything is probably a bad idea yeah and even like we're designing the game in the way where it's like you are expected to screw up at some points and you can't just quick load like, if you screw up and people see you, that's a uh, expected state at, in sometimes, and part of the game is designing your ability to, like, get out of that in fun ways. Um, but that said, there are probably going to th be things later on where um, there, are res there, there are effects to you killing things not necessarily in the same way as like the chaos system though i was just curious like so like if you did shit like oh i don't know like maybe there's something trapped in a house and, and you murder everyone guarding the house and it gets out later or da 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 like i was curious if there was going to be repercussions to the actions you take or if like each of the areas are relatively self-contained slash because it's always interesting when you do something and then there's consequences yeah um, I I think that that kind of remains to be seen. Uh, the Gloomwood's kind of being we have a lot of design already for later areas, but there's also a lot that we're designing as we go. Um, so that would be the sort of thing where it's like if um situation comes up where it would make sense to do something like that, probably, but um, it still remains to be seen. Fair enough. Um, so there's been parrying in Dusk and Chop Goblins. I know this isn't necessarily your brainchild, but it, does, does this trend continue of yet more parry? <laughs> Sorry, what was that? There's been parrying in like Dusk and Chop Goblins, and though this isn't your brainchild per se, is that a trend we get to continue? Maybe like, not uh, in so far as bullet reflection, but just parrying oh, in general. Oh, um, well, you can... You can parry swords in Gloomwood. I don't know if that that counts. Well. That the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the risk reward thing of like, hey, do you want to risk getting a sword in the face? Yeah. So I, I guess so. I, I just figured I'd ask that because like yeah, yeah. Uh, it a a lot of the chopped goblins. You're right. Yeah. No. Uh, I, I mean, it was sort of interesting to actually see that one in chopped goblins. It's pretty hilarious when you actually yeah. pull it off right, and it's just 
dead goblin the next second. But um, well, it's one of those things that's just it's pretty easy to code, and it's something that people always try, and it's like, eh, might as well make it a thing that can happen. Fun. Yeah, no, it's also like one of those rewarding things you just get to feel good when you pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, here's the thing. Gloomwood is a immersive sim, obviously. This tends to cause people to try very interesting ways of problem solving that you didn't really intend or foresee. What's your favorite examples that have cropped up in Gloomwood? Um, everything that Blasco Art does on Twitter. <laughs> Dude plays it like a Dishonored style ninja game. <laughs> I mean, if you um, want to stick a link up, we can maybe try and get like a little clip of this going just so. True. Yeah, uh, just a little link because I don't actually know his, his Twitter handle or anything, and we can stick that in the video for people to, to witness. Yeah, here you go. I. I, I think I saw it. Video is, but a link Twitter. of it, but that was the one where it's like he deliberately like um, triggered some people to come in and then like set off a fucking trapped safe. Yeah, in it. yeah. I would say that so far, um, it's uh, it's been difficult for people to find things that we didn't anticipate happening. Um, but that will also probably change as we continue into larger districts of the game and add more add more um, mechanics and stuff like that. Which, I guess, on that front, like, how much do you still feel is to come for Gloomwood insofar as mechanics and also areas? Uh, a decent amount. Um, I mean, really, the what was in early access is only really the introdu introductory part of the game. Um, we've still got uh, a lot to go. But thankfully now we've gotten past a lot of the under the hood mechanical problems that were taking so long um, and now can focus more on actually creating the content. So it should come much faster than uh, than this first bit took. So how do you feel like the scope of the game is going to like expand from here, like comparatively to what there's already there? Um, I don't think the scope is going to expand much beyond what we have planned, I would say, but um, as far as compared to what's there, um, geez, probably a good five or six times larger, uh, if not more, yeah. Um, so is there anything in Gloomwood that you feel benefited from your experience in earlier titles for what you're bringing to the game? I think that's kind of hard for me to say. Like, uh, as the person, um, I mean, it, it's, I, I think since, since I was so, um, involved in determining the new sort of aesthetic direction and atmospheric direction and stuff, probably that, um, yeah, other, other, I don't know, it's a little hard to say because I'm, like, the person in the midst of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is more something you'll you'll be able to think about in retrospective later. Probably, yeah. Uh, in that case, just at this juncture, is there anything else you would like to share about Gloomwood or even other side projects you might be working on since you keep busy? <laughs> um, no, not that you can really. share. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not really at this moment. We're kind of um. After we're there's a patch for the, the that we're working on for the um, tavern stuff, and then after that we're just kind of getting our putting our heads down, and working more on uh, the next big content update. And as far as my own stuff, I'm like I said, I'm mostly taking it easy this year on my own solo stuff. And there's some things that. Uh, just are not announced yet. Fair uh, enough. Hopefully will be within the not too long. Um, so here's a, a question I meant to tackle earlier. It sort of uh, slipped my mind, but this is a more of a general one. Uh, a uh, 
a viewer, Peter Hill, actually wrote in my comments. So I was asking people if they had any questions for you specifically, and he was curious what sort of stages you prefer, both design-wise and going through. Labyrinth-style levels like Doom, or the more gritty, real-world locations like you'd see in Duke Nukem. Or like the abandoned gas station at Dusk, for instance. Um, I don't think that I'm good at designing things that aren't at least a little bit abstract. Like, Dusk is a very abstract game, even when it's real-world locations like the, uh, like Ghost Town. That's still, it's, it's still kind of crazy weird design. Um, and what I've found is that when it's, when it, it's like places that are more open to me coming, just having weird ideas and being able to do those, um, the ideas flow a lot better than when it's just like, oh, I'm trying to recreate this specific thing uh, realistically. That's I'm just not very good at that. Uh, in terms of playing, I kind of like both. It just depends. Like, um, one of my, Doom is one of my favorite games, and Doom is extremely abstract, and I like that about it. Um, another one of my favorite games is uh, the game Infra, which is a source engine um, sort of exploring uh, urban exploration game, and it is it is extremely realistic in its I level. heard about this. I think you're actually the one that directed me to it. You were like, Probably. I was feeling for it because I just love it so much. Um, so I really like both. It just depends on the game. Um, in terms of specifically classic shooters, I like retro boomer shooters. I do like there to be a little bit of an abstract element or a little bit of a surreal, not quite reality element to it. Um, I prefer that than just shooting my way through like, oh, it's a normal city street or whatever. I think you can kind of see that in Chop Goblins too, mm -hmm. where it's like, even, even, the, even the city street levels are like, the buildings are weird and don't make the most logical sense and really by the time you get to Greece I had just given up entirely and trying to make it realistic and I'm just like nah giant you know 10 story tall pillar building things is just because it's cool yep yep so yeah I think that's that that handles that pretty well in which case so is there anything else at this juncture that you would want to share with your audience or the audience I guess I don't think so We've, we've covered quite a bit. We really have. Um, so yeah. lastly, are there any indie projects that you currently have your eye on? It's your time um, to plug your favorite things. Let's see. As I'm still waiting uh, with bated breath for um, Shadows of Doubt, which I'm really excited for. I don't know when that's coming out. Um, Compound Fracture looks awesome excited for that uh let's see what else let me look at my wish list here that, that'll help just me just typing these in to like quickly be like oh what's this um I, like i said i'm on a half-life kick so i'm hoping operation black mesa will release someday uh oh is that a, a remake of um god damn it you know what i'm just it's a remake of the the two expansion packs um wait so two opposing, expansion packs I, yeah opposing force and blue shift Ooh, that's interesting yeah, yeah it's supposed to be both of them uh what else do we have in here There's oh my god here. compound fracture looks like uh dino crisis yeah it's it looks really cool i hope it is really cool um oh the uh the robocop game from uh, the Terminator Resistance developers. Excited for that. Um, why is this on my list? It doesn't look good at all. Let's get rid of that. Uh, yeah, don't don't worry, yeah, folks. It, it's just it's just Dave talking about food and dine and dash. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Hi, bats. I I don't know what that is, but that. Oh, uh, what is this? Outbreak multiplayer storm chasing experience that i'm sure that'll be cool oh here's this this one i'm sure this game doesn't even exist it's called urban explorer the release date is coming soon um 
and I'm this this looks like it's probably vaporware be, because I adore urban exploration. I used um, to do that. Yeah, I've I that's where some of the textures for dusk came from, actually. You running around like abandoned houses, taking shots of them, and then like yeah, it. yeah, nice. Yeah. Um. So yeah, lots of stuff. Uh, and there's which some stuff on here I've forgotten about. Fish, what is this? Fish simo, simophis, fish simophis. It looks like a fishing horror game. Huh. Anyway, we. <laughs> I suppose this is a pretty good time to wind things down. So you folks here can buy Wishless Gloomwood on Steam. You can also search up for other games that Dave has made by just looking at at his developer tag and clicking on that on Steam. For news, there's at DuskDev and also at TafferKing451 on Twitter. There's even a link tree with even more shiny sites on it, like their Discord, which I also put in this video's description. Uh, and is there anywhere else you'd care to send people to? Oh, that sounds like it about covers it. All right, in which case, Thanks for tuning in, folks. If you agree, disagree, or have something to say to me or Dave, feel free to comment. And if you have an interest in supporting my efforts to create new indie reviews, interviews, and gaming content, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you know when there's a new release. There's also a Discord, links in the description, so you can be part of our community, the Crit Hit Cauldron. And with all that said, I'll catch you in the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks. Bye, everybody.